Matthew 10, 28 says, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. First of all, traditionalists use this as a proof text for an immortal soul, amazingly enough. This seems preposterous given the fact that the soul is said to be utterly destroyed in the text, ultimately. Yes, the only way for them to promulgate this misuse is to misunderstand, in my opinion, the first half of the text while either ignoring or butchering the second half of it to death. Apparently, the confusion surfaces for them in the first part of the text, where it says that men cannot kill the soul, even though they can kill the body. However, given that the Greek word for kill is, I cannot pronounce that, apoktene, uh, <laughs> which means to put to death, destroy, kill, or slay, it should be obvious that it is synonymous with apolumi, which is rightfully translated as destroy, a few words later in the same passage. Um, I have never received a decent or fathomable answer as to how it is remotely plausible for one to assign the term kill for body in the first part of Matthew 10, 28, the precise opposite meaning one assigns destroy for both body and soul within the same passage when it should be clear they're meant to communicate the same ordeal. Yes, it should go without saying that kill and destroy are synonyms instead of antonyms in this passage. Doesn't seem remotely honest to claim the opposite just to uphold a hell that never ever consumes, contradicting the text that say it does, clearly. As one website, I'll put the link below, puts it, there is not the slightest suggestion of torment in any of the places where Apollo is translated destroy in the AV. And um, I'll post the scriptures. And please check out those texts, especially those, um, especially since those noted are within the same book as the text in question. Psyche is the Greek word translated as soul. By looking at Matthew 16, 25, and 26, we can see what it means and how that Greek term is used. It says, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. So apparently psyche, translated as soul in Matthew 10, 28, can sometimes mean life, as witnessed elsewhere in the book of Matthew. This Greek term psyche, like the Hebrew terms nephesh and even sometimes ruach, denotes breath, life, vitality. In some cases, this term, psyche or soul, can mean the entire person, in others, the life or breath or vitality of a person. A couple more examples of the Hebrew and Greek words for soul being translated as life are in Leviticus 17.11, where the life of a creature is in the blood, and in Mark 10.45, where Christ gave his life or soul as a ransom for many, which of course is another instance where a soul died. Otherwise, how did Christ give his as a ransom? Christians will tell you he gave his body alone, but scripture says he gave his soul in Mark 10.45 explicitly. Further, in Isaiah 53.12, a nephesh, soul, the Hebrew equivalent to the Greek psyche, as used in Matthew 10.28, is poured out unto death. Ezekiel the prophet twice says, the soul that sins, it shall die. Just more solid and irrefutable proof that the Christian deception that souls cannot die is easily proven wrong. Just a brief exercise in substituting immortal soul for soul in Matthew 10, 28, or any of these other texts would tell you how ridiculous it would be to read that concept into all these texts where the soul dies or gets destroyed. It would only make sense that one cannot, if one is honest, interpret the first half of Matthew 10, 28 in contradiction to the plethora of explicit texts where the soul can positively die and be destroyed. Nor would it be honest to interpret the second half in contradiction to the plethora of texts where the final fate of the wicked is described as a perishing, a reduction to ashes or stubble, an irreversible consumption, etc., to name just a few explicit and unambiguous descriptors. So, now we must reconcile all this. I think Matthew 10:28 is about the first and second death and the difference in the two, which I'll get into a little bit more a little bit later. First, how can we reconcile the fact that Matthew 10, 28 says that men cannot kill the soul when other texts say the soul can die, even in the first death it would seem? Well, I think this can be reconciled when we acknowledge that since the soul can mean the life of a person, this is never irreversibly annihilated as long as God is willing to return the life in a resurrection. 
So in the first death, they are with him, and hence men cannot destroy one's resurrection hope in the following sense. Job 34 says, If he should set his heart to it, and gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together, and men would return to dust. So texts like these communicate that our lives, our breath, or spirit, which is sometimes synonymous with soul when soul means life or vitality in context, return to the God who gave them when we die. In this sense, then, it should be apparent that men aren't able to erase that which returns to God, who wills to return that life or breath and vitality in a resurrection. In the latter half of Matthew 10, 28, however, God doesn't will to return the lives forever lost in any more resurrections, so that second death, that irreversible annihilation, is to be feared, for therein lies no more hope of life and breath. I think this is the only possible interpretation of Matthew 10, 28 that remains in line cohesively and logically with Scripture as a whole. Let's reiterate this again with some poetic texts in Ezekiel that beautifully describe the resurrection to bring these points home, I hope. Ezekiel 37, starting in verse 4, says, He said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Did you notice in verse 5 how Yahweh will make breath enter you so that you will come to life in the resurrection? I have heard traditionalists sort of make fun of these kinds of descriptions of the resurrection, calling it a recreation and saying it's off the mark. But whatever you want to call it, and I don't think anyone should go beyond scripture, The resurrection is a coming back to life by having breath come back into you, as opposed to already being alive, awake, and breathing. No, the resurrection isn't here or anywhere ever described as a person already awake and breathing, just waiting anciently for dust to be made into flesh again so that one may somehow acquire a body again. The resurrection is getting life back, not already being alive, waiting just to get a body back. In summary, man may kill you, but God can give your life and breath back to you in a a resurrection. And men cannot take that life away. In that sense, you're as good as alive to God due to the inevitable and poignant resurrection around the corner. Yes, when we die, our life and breath is in God's hands. He has it to return to us. Men can't take that away. However, genuine and severe fear should overtake you at the thought of the second death where resurrection is no longer a promise where your life is no longer in God's hands to return on some hopeful, benevolent future day because it is gone forever, irreversibly annihilated. Malachi chapter 4 verses 1 through, f- 1 through 3 say that evildoers will ultimately become stubble after being set ablaze and that they will be ashes under the soles of the feet of the righteous. This irreversible annihilation is also explicitly described in Revelation 20:14, where death is said to be thrown into the lake of fire. Scripture clearly says death will be annihilated annihilated forever as the last enemy, yet Christians will, without a second thought, say that the lake of fire never annihilates anything just to accommodate the false preconception that the wicked thrown the same place can never ever be annihilated. If your doctrines result in such monstrous, obvious inconsistencies, they at the very least need to be seriously reevaluated, no? If the lake of fire annihilates death, then it logically does the same to the wicked, of course, One cannot reasonably assign the lake opposite functions within the same line of scriptural thought according to biases while at the same time claiming to care about the facts. As one website wisely puts it in a sound and logical interpretation of the text in question, fear not them which kill the body but are not able to destroy you utterly and finally. For the disciple his life is hid with Christ in God and although men may kill the body in the resurrection, this life will be given back to the body. Yes, the text in question isn't teaching dualism so much as distinguishing the first death from the second. One is not to be feared, the other for sure. Is your life or soul really lost forever in the first death? Of course not. And that is what Matthew is essentially communicating. Texts like Mark 10.30 talk about the age to come, the eternal life. And 1 Timothy 4.8 distinguishes the present life from the life to come. It is that soul, that eternal life, that men cannot destroy. Only God can eradicate that prospect. There is simply no single text supporting a person living on, awake, and breathing after death. And plenty 
to say the least, explicitly articulating the opposite, so we must reason with commonly misused texts instead of interpreting them outside Scripture's established foundational kindergarten truths. This should be pretty simple to do in Matthew 10, 28, because God and his Son want us to keep the resurrection close in mind as our only hope to live. Though Hellenized Christianity has twisted this hope and transferred immortality to the time of death instead of placing the gift where it should be, in a resurrection, there really is no excuse for this except deception, and no one should remain there willfully.